Lenny Hayes, what a wonderful night he's had. 22 disposals. Ball. He's got great skills. And he makes no mistake. Well, I've been threatening for a while. Well, our next special guest on the program played 142 games for the Saints, uh, played an additional 81 with Collingwood, was the best and fairest winner with St Kilda in 2005, runner-up the previous year in 04, captain the club as well in 2006 and 2007. He was a premiership player, unfortunately, in the wrong jumper, but he did get there in, uh, in 2010. Uh, Luke Ball, thanks for, for joining us on our podcast this week. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for inviting me. Now... When it all started for you, obviously, you were part of the now-dubbed Super Draft and with good reason, uh, selected pick two after Luke Hodge in that 2001 draft. Can you take us through to, to that period? Were you always linked to St Kilda? Were you sort of, did you have contact with Hawthorne or, or other clubs sort of later in the, the draft? And, and obviously, when you arrived at the Saints that first year, you spent obviously doing your schooling and didn't play in, in 2002 and had a few injury concerns. So can you take us through, I guess, your, your arrival at the club and, and how that all came about? Well, I was a, a Mad Hawk supporter growing up. Um, had uh, a couple of uncles that played through the 80s when they were pretty successful, obviously, and, and into the 90s. And, um, yeah, so uh, the, the, there was always a, well, there was a faint chance there um, that... Uh, you know, with Hawthorne having having the first pick, that um, that I might end up there, and um, I suppose the the romantic part of you um, would have seen the uh, you know seen the good part of that. But um, I remember getting a phone call the night before the draft um, from Tomo, obviously coach at the time, um, saying that uh, that they'd be um, calling my name out at pick two. So. Uh, both my parents breathed a, a big sigh of relief because uh, the, the picks after two were, I think, West Coast at three and then Fremantle at four. Um, and we'd, we'd spoken to um, both those clubs at the time. And, um, yeah, you're right, I, I was I was still completing year 11 or just completed year 11. So um, had year 12 to look forward to the year after. And mum and dad were pretty keen for me to, to finish my schooling at, uh, at the school that I'd that I'd done, you know, they'd been at for the, the previous six or so years. So uh, the thought of having to go into state at that time, um, they weren't crash hot on. I, at the time, I would have, I would have been happy to go, of course. Um, uh, you, you put your name in the draft and you, you can end up anywhere. So, but as it was, um, actually, got like the first call from Hawthorne, I think, from John Turnbull, who was the uh, recruiting manager at Hawthorne, saying that they were going to go with, with Hodgie. And then... Not long after, I got a call from Tomo and Johnny Beveridge saying that um, that uh, that they'd be calling me out of pick two. So, um, I'm not sure I slept a heap that night, the night before the draft anyway, but at least going to the draft, I, I was um, reasonably assured of, of where I was going to end up. Now, you talk about speaking to the clubs and getting phone calls from the clubs and that sort of thing. But what about between yourselves and yourself and Juddy and Hodgie and them? Did you talk much between yourselves thinking, yeah, okay, we're going to end up here, I'm going to end up here, that sort of thing? Uh, probably towards the end there. when, Yeah, probably the, the, the couple of weeks leading into the draft. Um, and, and back then, so what are we talking, almost 20 years ago, there, there certainly wasn't the focus on, on the, the draft that there is now. It was probably only just starting around then. Uh, in terms of you know the odd article in the paper and all that sort of stuff, and um, towards the draft when all the you know probably all the talk was around um, the three of us, and there were a couple of articles, um, we started to to think about it. And I, but I guess you got a fair bit of other stuff going on as well. I mean, I think Juddy would have been in year twelve. I was you know, doing year eleven exams, so you got a bit to a bit to focus on. And you're trying to um, you're trying to trying to focus on that as much as possible until your name's actually called out because you can't do much um, other than prepare yourself physically as well. So, um, yeah, there was a bit of banter. And I'd I'd known Hodgie from, oh, I played in an under-12 team with him, even though he was a Colac boy. I played in an under-12 rep team with him. Uh, Played cricket against him, so I knew him reasonably well. Juddie was a year above. Um, Back then, you could be drafted as a 17-year-old. So, 
but yeah, played at Sandringham Dragons and played school footy against him. So I knew knew those guys and and, and a handful of others um, just you know, by playing rep teams along the way with them reasonably well. So um, whenever you bumped into them, you, you had a good chat, obviously. But um, yeah, there there wasn't a heap of uh, I suppose speculation heading into that from our point of view, anyway. Heading into that not that day. Obviously, the, the super draft for, named that for, for good reason and, and the careers that all three of you had probably helped kind of cement the, the type of uh, media around the draft that, that has turned into these days. But between the three of you, was there much banter you know, through your careers and, and, and at the end of them based on, on how each of you performed? Uh, there wasn't, no. There, I, I mean, clearly, um, yeah, the, the two guys either side of me, and I say, you know, I say this with, with, without any sort of false modesty. Um, you know, those two guys are, are, are Hall of Famers. You know, they're, 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 they've had some of the most decorated um, careers of all time. So I must admit when, um, when they talk about the Super Draft and the 2001 Draft and, and my name just sort of just dags on to the end of a few of the others, I, you know, I, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to, to, to cop that and to accept that. But... Um, uh, yeah, I, I was more, I think early days, I think you're probably right, I think early days, um, and I reckon we're seeing it with young guys now, you, there is a bit of that competitive um, rivalry that, uh, that you don't want to get left behind. Um, and I had, to, I had a bit of a wait to, to get going. I think both those guys and, and um, a handful of others as well, including some of the guys that, that, um, that I got drafted with at the Saints, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Um, got going pretty early on, and I had to sit back and watch a bit, and that was reasonably tough because you you um, you didn't want to get left behind, and you wanted to prove that you were as capable as them. And then as your career goes on, I think you you sit back and and appreciate those guys as players as well, uh, like like the general footy public do. And um, as I said, you know th- those two in particular uh we'll, we'll go down as as all-time great so yeah i i um, very much enjoy watching them um and you know jimmy bartell was in that draft gary Ablett jr who's still playing uh he's the last one standing i think uh it was was taken father son in that draft as well so um yeah as i said when, when uh when uh, when the draft's spoken about in those terms, and and if I can just sneak even half a mention towards somewhere towards the end, I'm I'm, I'm okay with that. So Grant Thomas was, was very big in that era on obviously creating that family environment. I think at the at the club and and bringing you all together. But if you look at our draft hall over that period, so the year before you is Rewald and Kaczynski. In your year, it's Xavier Clark, Nick Del Sano, Lee Montagna, Matt McGuire. A year later is Brendan Goddard and I think Sam Fisher potentially around about that time as well. So yeah, obviously yeah. all stars of, of the game and, and of the club that would sort of come through together. Um, how important or significant was that in the group that you're, you know, you're all the same age, you've all come through together. Um, you, you actually grew effectively from the same age through the system and made us successful pretty quickly in 04. Yeah, I mean, it was obviously uh, it came about or a circumstance of, of or, you know, the back of a reasonably poor era for the club in terms of um, results, uh, which which um, allows you to to have access to those early picks, and it's one thing to have access to them, and obviously you've, you've got to get them right, and um, I guess we were the beneficiaries of that, and and, and yeah, all those guys you mentioned, it was it was. Um, it was fantastic to enter the club with all those guys at a period, and and I think we all, uh, though, absolutely benefited from from some of the experience that was there. You know, the champions of the club that were still there when we when we walked in. Um, some of the greatest names of the club, you know, Lowe, um, you know, Burke, Harvey, uh, Hamill, Gehrig, Andrew Thompson, um, Justin Peckett, Ozzy Jones. Um, you know Stevie Powell and, and a handful of others. We we were lucky that um, that we came into the club, um, as I said, off the back of a lean period, but but um, walked into a place with uh, with fantastic role models. Um, and whilst we we spent a lot of time together as young guys um, and formed some you know some a, a really strong group within a group. Um, from that point of view, we, we were very much the beneficiaries of of those fantastic. Uh, guys leading by example so um, 
you know, it only took a couple of years for, for I guess, the old that were there and, and this young group coming through um, uh, who, whose um, standards had to, had, to, had to pretty quickly meet those of the older players. Um, it didn't take too long for the results to start to turn and, and, and for us to start to, to win, to win some, some games of footy. So yeah, thinking of winning and that sort of thing. So 2003, basically, first year you're playing games and we start towards the end of 2003 really picking up, picking up wins, getting uh, finished the season off, season off quite well, just missing out in finals, really. Um, having a look at towards the end of 2003, do you think we could, the way that we finished that, move into 2004 and just start the way that the club did? It was, yeah, 10 straight and made it all the way to, into the finals and basically miss out on the grand final by a kick. Yeah, I think we did. I mean, we, the younger group were pretty um, uh, pretty confident in, in, in our ability and, and, and our ability to push ourselves to, to improve over that time. And, and it was led by Tomo. And, and through that time, you know, we went on some fantastic uh, camps, you know, before training camps were training camps in a sense. You know, Tomo doesn't, doesn't get much credit probably, probably for... Um, for, for pioneering those in a sense, but you know we had a great end of 2003. We had a fantastic training camp to to London for three weeks. I think it, it was at the time. Um, you know, as a 19, 20 year old, um, you couldn't ask for much more. And um, and you know we had access to some some unbelievable world class facilities and athletes. And um, in a sense, we were pretty spoiled from a young age because that became the expectation from that from that point on. But he set a pretty high bar, Tom Owen. Um, in a sense, that camp was was a bit of a uh, yeah, a bit of a, a match that was lit under the group, and and, uh, and as I said, it, it probably um, came at, at a right time in terms of the the senior core still you know, playing really really strong footy um, and demanding really high standards of of the younger group, and then some pretty pretty sharp development from. You know, even even across that pre-season uh, from 03 to 04 from all those those guys that you mentioned earlier, uh, as well as adding a few in the draft. So, um, I mean, you never expect to probably win, to jump out of the blocks like we did and win, and win 10 in a row as easily as we did. But, um, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we started to get going really strongly. And, and, and along with that, you really enjoy what you're doing then when, when you're playing that well as a team and, and, and your standards are high. And, um, everyone knows what's expected of them, and um, yeah, I, I'm sure we'll talk about uh, you know, what happened towards the end of the year. At the end of the day, what we were we were a kick away from from playing a grand final, and 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 the other thing that that was a obviously a really strong era of of competition as well. I mean, that was Brisbane Brisbane coming off their their di- their dynasty and um, Port Adelaide. At that stage, I think it finished on top of the ladder for, for two of those years and and, uh, and had fallen short in the final. So uh, we came up against them over on their uh, home patch uh, in a prelim final and um, were dominant early, of course. And in the end, it was a it was one of those games that, that could go either way, and, and not one that I think about too much. The, the losing prelims and losing finals, you, you don't tend to think about too much, but um, you tend to sort of push those down towards the, the very, very back of your, of your memory. But, uh, yeah, you, you look, I suppose, you, when you do reflect on them, they, they are missed opportunities now. You talk about the group and the young guys especially being really confident and kind of full of exuberance and that sort of stuff. After that, that first half of that season, the type of footy that you guys were playing under Tomo, how confident were you guys heading into that final series? Uh, we were. Um, we were we were certainly confident that the and we we'd shown that our best footy against uh, you know, all the, the teams throughout the year um, stacked up really well. You know we had that fantastic game against Brisbane um, under the roof at Eddie had where we where we proved that we could mix it with the big boys, I guess if you want to put it that way. And um, and so yeah, we 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 were we were confident that that uh, you know that we earned our spot in that top four and that we were. Um, you know, that we were in good shape to have a fair crack at it. I guess what um, you know, what we learned 
though, in that first final, was that finals footy is a different kettle of fish. And um, I do have a you know, pretty clear memory of that uh, that night and that being a real shock to the system. And, um, you know, almost uh, it, literally for me, I remember getting a whack in the face. I remember lining up against Simon Black. This is 04, the first final up in Brisbane there. And I remember lining up on Simon Black in the first bounce and um, the ball came down and, and his arm flew back and it was an accident, but just whacked me right in the eye. And uh, and um, and I couldn't see for about 90 seconds, and and that set the tone for the night. Unfortunately, <laughs> what were we? 80 points down at half time or something. It was a disaster. But I think in the end it was. Um, I mean, you never want to. You never want to. Never want to get thumped uh, in a final like that. But uh, it was probably not a bad thing, especially for the younger guys in the group. Say, so, okay, that you know, home and away footy is one thing, but. You got to lift. You got to raise your level um, when the uh, when the whips are cracking in, at the end of the year. How was the health of the group twelve months later? Obviously, you had the terrific period there, oh four, runner up in the BNF, then winning it in in oh five. But I think a lot of Saints fans look at oh five perhaps as a bigger missed opportunity. Obviously, they they went to Adelaide and and won the first final so impressively. Had the week off. Sydney had that grueling run through and. I think we were 15 yeah, yeah. points up just before three-quarter time in the prelim against Sydney. But we had a lot of injuries. Um, yeah. How was the, the health of the group? Could you see that coming, I guess, what happened in that last quarter? I think looking back now, yeah, we... Yeah, you never want to make excuses, but I think that was... You know, I remember the last... Was it the last... Uh, or the second last home and away game against Frio over there where, where we lost after the sire and Longview will kick that goal... And we were dropping like flies. I think Luke Penny hurt himself. Um, Goose might have hurt himself. Maxie Hudson uh, on the top, or, you know, on top of Aaron Hamill was injured, I think. And um, in a sense, we really did limp into that final series. Even having been one of the best teams throughout the year, uh, you do need a bit of luck towards the end of the year with 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 injury and 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 uh, and those sort of things. So. Um, to go to Adelaide in that first final, um, and essentially, you know, halves halves played him by himself in that first court, in that first half, and then a few of us decided to uh, to jump on his back, and, and that was a that was um, you know, one of the best wins I've ever been a part of. Uh, it was was amazing, um, but it possibly uh, covered up a little bit the fact that we were just going physically, um, and I reckon I was starting to struggle with McGroin's a bit towards the end of that year as well. I was just hanging on. Um, and, yeah, we made it to three-quarter time, even in the prelim, and just didn't quite have the uh, have the gas to, to, to match it with the Swans. And, and you know, credit to them. They, they, they had a full head of steam as well. They, they'd, um, they'd, uh, they just, just got over the Cats, hadn't they, the week before. And... and um, no, they were uh, they got themselves on a roll in that last quarter, and and we couldn't stop it. So, again, um, don't like don't like thinking about it too much because it really is. Uh, yeah, anytime you lose a prelim, um, and that year, I think you know we we certainly proved ourselves as one of the be- as one of the better teams in the comp, but weren't uh, weren't good enough and weren't fit enough when um, when it mattered. Oh uh, five, you won the best and fairest. You shared it with another hard nut, number ten in, in Stevie Baker. Uh, now, I texted Bakes just before we jumped on this call to ask if he had any funny stories or anything to tell us about you that we could, we could ask about. <laughs> and he wrote back one line. It was just, nah, mate, he was a nerd. <laughs> Have you got anything about Bakes that you can, you can tell us? Oh, how long have we got? <laughs> We've got as long, long as you've got. Nah. <laughs> oh, Bakes. Um, he's a nerd. Uh, he's, a, he's a classic. We, I saw him, uh, when was it? Oh, it was the start of the year. No, when was Lenny's beer? At the start of the year, we, we snuck up to uh, to Sydney to surprise Lenny for his 40th birthday. And Bakes had been in the Gold Coast. Um, and Troy Schwartz and Milne had organised it. It was going to be a surprise. So uh, they teed it up with his brother-in-law to to um, to pick pick uh, Lenny up in the morning, um, you know, come up with some sort of plan, low-key plan, and, and take him the other side of town just to have lunch, just for the two of them, um, before Tara, his wife, was going to pick him up and, and I think take him out for dinner and stay in the city or something like that. Anyway, so we're all in on it. And yep, we, we fly up that morning and 
we meet at the, the Watson's Bay Hotel, we all check in um, and then, you know, quickly get changed, get ourselves into a, you know, a taxi to get to the, to the, uh, to the, the, the pub that we were having lunch at. Bakes is coming from the Gold Coast, so he's going to meet us there. So we're in contact with him. Um, anyway, his flight gets delayed. So he was supposed to arrive before us. He gets there. So we're all at the hotel waiting, well, you know, waiting. Where's Bakes? Where's Bakes? Everyone's here except him. Next thing he arrives and and he's gone all red and uh, he's always, I think, I've, I think I've stuffed it. I think I've ruined the surprise. He's arrived at the Watson's Bay Hotel just as Lenny and his brother have pulled in to drop their bags off to stay at. So he hasn't seen him for ages. They literally walk in to the reception together. Lenny sees Bakes. Bakes sees Lenny. He tries to hide, but he completely blows the cover. And the, and the whole weekend was, the whole the whole plan was ruined. Um, and that pretty well sums up Bakes in a story. But no, nah, he was uh, he was uh, he was one of the funniest teammates, um, and and one of the one of the best teammates, one of the most reliable blokes, and just a bloke you just love to play with. He was. He was so tough. I mean, that, that team of the early 2000s, um, I was talking about it with, uh, with I think, Goose the other day. Um, the, the amount of um, hard nuts, the amount of guys that um, would just physically sacrifice their body for the team was extraordinary. When you think about Baker and Rewald, Kajitsky, uh, Steve Lawrence, Powell, Thompson, uh, Maguire, Brett Voss. Uh, it was one of those Hamill. It was um, it really was um, a high standard to set. And for us young guys, if you didn't, um, you know, we used to say if you didn't take a turn for the team, then then um, you'd uh, you'd get found out pretty quick in that scene. So Bakes was the uh, the epitome of that, and it was a, a huge honour to be able to um, share the best and fairest with him in, in 2005. Off the back of that, what does it what does it mean to you to? now forever be a St Kilda best and fairest winner to be a Trevor Barker medalist and especially of that team I mean you you generally don't you genuinely don't uh, play or cover individual awards but um, that is yeah that is something that I, that I look back on with with great pride uh, absolutely um, especially with the fact that it's it's um, that it's named the Trevor Barker award as well and, and you hear about the regard that and the esteem that he's held in uh, at the club and, and in the broader AFL community. So that's um, yeah, that's uh, that's something that I, I absolutely treasure and, and look back on with great pride. Now and then on the back of that, 2006, you actually get named as captain under the GT rotation policy, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, so what, what, how did that come about? Was did the best and fairest have any sort of bearing of effect on it? The GT basically pull your side and say it's your job or do you want it or how did it all go getting the job? Yeah, no, it started, it obviously started a few years earlier and, and Tomo, um, that was one of his real strong suits. I think he's, um, he's, you know, management of people and, and he'd had some corporate experience obviously before he's, before he started coaching. And, um, and again, you know, I think I think he was probably the, the first to really introduce leadership groups. Um, and I remember him talking to me about an 04 when I was only 20 odd, just about um, even going through the process of, of nominating yourself. And um, that's how we used to do it back then. If you wanted to be a part of it, you you uh, put your hand up and, and, and got up in front of the group and explained why you why you um, wanted to be wanted to represent the group and even going through that process as I look back now as a 20, 21 year old um, is, is a good one is a development exercise because uh, it's not necessarily comfortable. You know, you don't get up and, 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 and talk about it yourself. It's, it's something that, that um, it takes you know, practice and it's not a, not a naturally comfortable thing. So, um, so that, so that it started a few years earlier and, and, um, it was against the, the trend a bit, and, and I remember, him, yeah, coming to me and and, and um, you know, th- suggesting that, that this is what what he thought um, would would uh, be of benefit to me in the in the long run. And you know, looking back now, I was I was um, twenty one, turning twenty two, so still really young, 
and yeah, not ready for it really, but uh, and and I you know, struggled at certain times throughout the year with it. You know, when you when you think about um, some of the senior players that were that were still running around for the club, you know, to think that I was was running out or leading them out and, and tossing the coin, it, it uh, you know at times it, it it didn't really sit that comfortable with with me. But I look back now and and um, and see the method to his madness a bit and. and um, and take some, you know, take some strong lessons from from that season. And you know, what 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 made it even more challenging was that I, I was wasn't going that well physically on the field either. So the, the the natural thing when you when you're not playing as well as you would have liked is to is to revert back to thinking about yourself and how can I only get myself back. But but you know, I remember talking to him throughout the year. Part of the challenge of being a leader is is to um, is to constantly be thinking about others and 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 how you, how you can help your your teammates and the team, not just how you're going. So that was you know at a very general level, that was one of the lessons that I that I learned that year. I guess a two part question, the, the last one from me. Um, obviously, you, you struggled with the body a, a little bit over that period. I mean, you were captain under Grant Thomas in '06, and then when he departed the club, you were I think co-captain in in '07 under Ross. Um, we know obviously it's been spoken about a, a lot, but you, you worked through St Kilda's next really legitimate shot at it in, in 2009, which was clearly a, a horrible day for a lot of people. You were contributing well that day, and we know it was much spoken about the limited game time in the, uh, in the last term. Can you sort of take us through, I guess, the sequence of events that, that saw that be your last game at the club and I guess how your relationship is with Ross now uh, all these years down the track? Yeah, I'll work back. I, yeah, I'll... Man, Ross is fine. He's he's back now. He's he's living not not far away. I still see him a fair bit. I live around the corner from Rui. I see a lot of Rui and um, and uh, yeah, bump into to, to Ross a fair bit. And and um, I know I said I had great respect for him as a person and a coach. Um, it didn't end up uh, how I would have liked at the club, obviously. But um, any other thing, you know, it's. it's it's been what, ten or eleven years now, so um, yeah, we're, we're we're fine. We we um, we've got a you know we've got a relationship, no, no problems there, and um, and likewise with with a lot of the players. And I'm really yeah really grateful for that because um, yeah, it was a it was a, a really a really tough time and, and ultimately a really tough decision. I mean, I think most players would love to. Um, uh, end up being a, a one club player and, and you know a three hundred game player and all that sort of stuff and uh, that was I was certainly no different and had had eight fantastic years at the club had some fantastic mates and loved the club loved the supporters um, in the end it was um, you know a decision that, that was made with my head and and, and not my heart uh, in terms of my footy and um, you know I was at a, a pretty low point in uh, in my Footy life and footy career, and and uh, was probably convinced in the end uh, needed to be convinced um, because um, yeah, as you said, we we got so close as a group and we hadn't hadn't got what we what we wanted. Um, so it was uh, you know needed needed some convincing that um, in order to revive uh, a, a, a spluttering footy career, I, I, I needed a, a fresh start. So um, without getting into too much you know, detail about it, that, that was sort of where, you know, where, where it ended up. Um, yeah, in the end, and I think he's, he's spoken about it as well, um, the, the way the team was going. Um, and that year in particular, it was you know, such an amazing year, 2009, and no injuries and um, you know, some, some players had come into the team were playing really strong roles you know, Clint Jones and Minnie McCall from these sort of guys and the squeeze was on and, and I got squeezed out and 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 I think um, in the end it, it just it just it did look like that the club was, was heading in a, in, a, in a different direction and that's not um, that's not unusual you know I think now we see it a fair bit so um, I don't have any um, I don't have any qualms with that uh, albeit that it was a, it was the hardest decision that I'd had to make to, to that point in my life and um, yeah but I, I can yeah 11 years on now I, uh, I um, 
you know, and, a, and a fair bit of water under the bridge, you, you, you get on with life. You have to, you, you can't get caught looking back too much because um, I heard the sports psychologist and say, if you, if you look too, too, too far back or if you're constantly living in the past, you, you're prone to, um, prone to, uh, prone to depression. And if you, if you're looking too far ahead, you, you're prone to anxiety. Um, so you, you've got to, and you've got to sort of try and live in the moment a fair bit. So that's, um, it's a bit of a long-winded, uh, long-winded answer to the question, but um, hopefully captured captured broadly what uh, what happened through that period. I guess just one more on on the topic without harping on too much about it, um, because we we don't often hear about the human perspective of of player movement in the competition. You always hear about the impact on a club, and uh, and obviously there was a lot written about yourself and Ross. But how much of an impact does does you leaving the club have on your your mates i mean obviously you mentioned you're still mates with a lot of the boys now and you still have a really strong relationship with a lot of them but especially having to come up against them the following year on grand final days um what impact did that have on on some of those relationships for a period yeah definitely definitely uh strain them clearly yeah you go from um you go from seeing them every day in the in the locker room and you know being really close to to um uh, moving on with it with a new group and and, and becoming a an opposition player um so there's yeah there's no doubt that uh that you, you that there's a bit of a strain on um on them for those that, that initial period and it's actually i remember um you know really early on so i'd, I'd only just moved and and i was still sort of uh still hanging hanging on to the the past a little bit and i remember you know a few people saying to me mate you the decision's made uh, there's no point in, in again looking back. You've got to you've got to you got to go full steam ahead. Otherwise, it'll it'll it won't work there either, and it'll just fizzle out. So, um, yeah, that's um, yeah for the for the first yeah few years um, there you, you you do sort of you, you do drift a little bit. But as I said, I'm really really wrapped now and pleased now that it um, you know that I'm you know I see a fair bit of of, of those guys that, that, um, you know, that I got drafted with and, and play a lot of footy with. And, um, we've all got kids now, so uh, of all similar age. So that's, it's great to see the next generation running around and playing together. So, um, and we, yeah, we, we reminisce every now and then, but we don't, we don't talk about footy, uh, you know, that much either because there's, there's so much else going on. So, so from that point of view, um, yeah, it was it was tough, time, but but um, it's been great that the times sort of you know worked through all that. And, and the other part was that that um, not only on, on mates and stuff, but but your family. That was that was the thing that that surprised me at the time. That um, how how uh, you probably took it for granted a bit, but how invested um, your parents and your family are in in you and and what you're doing in your career and. Um, it was the most upset I've ever seen my my parents when um, you know going through all that all that period and, and when I you know when I finally sort of made the decision to to, to move on um, that, that that really struck me as well uh, that that you know I'd never seen them and we yeah you know, we've been so fortunate um, you know my my life um, I, but I'd never seen them so emotionally affected by by anything so that, that 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 sort of struck me through that period as well now you mentioned meeting the seeing the players in the locker room and all that all the time now you're pretty much at Moorabbin in what we i guess we could call the dying years there before they headed down to seaford um yeah. have you seen the new facilities much on or, or look at around look at them and just sort of think mate i wish we had that when we were down there and <laughs> compare it to what you were using at that point and just look yeah. at the way you know what? Uh, you know, I did, now. Yeah, I have been lucky enough to be to have been shown through them and um they're fantastic. They're amazing. Actually I drove the I'm not too far away. I drove the girls um we were driving past I had the girls in the car and I thought uh, driving past Linton Street and I just pulled in the other week. Um there was obviously no one there because the players were all away but I just um quickly jumped out of the car and, and showed the uh the girls who were five and or nearly four. Um, this is where this is where Dad used to work with uh, with Nick, who they know, and Uncle Goose. Uh, you know, years ago. So uh, they're fantastic facilities. Um, 
but you know, it's funny, you do and you don't. Like we, and again, it wasn't, we didn't know any different back then, but um, we, had a, we had a footy oval with, you know, good, good grass. Um, we were doing weights on, you know, on the dance floor of the old um, disco that, uh, that Trevor Barker used to dominate apparently. Uh, we had a sauna. We had a sauna that they dusted off and re- and, uh, and, and dug back out for us. That Fraser Gehrig used to sit in the corner of and, and hold court. Um, and we didn't have much else, but we didn't need much else back then. And, and uh, you know, there was sort of a, uh, a charm to the old, old Moravant that, um, that you know, time goes on that you, you need to, obviously you need to keep up with the competition and improve your facilities. But now uh, part of me, part of me, um, and that's one thing that we do, we, we do reminisce about is, is the facilities that we used to enjoy in those early years at Moravant. We didn't want for much else. It was great. Well, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. I think it's um, yeah safe to suggest there's a, a fair bit of red and white and black that never left you. So, um, yeah, thanks for giving us a, a fair chunk of your time tonight and good luck with uh, with everything going forward. And, and thanks for, for all you did for the club when you were there. Oh, no worries. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Good kick again. Fine, Bassett. Fine, Lee. Fine, now. Fine. Oh, oh. intercepted by Harvey. He plays on the ball. Ball kicks the 